So I'm delighted today to be able to introduce Mike Anani. Um, Mike and I were chatting earlier and trying to figure out where we first met. Where did you meet? We didn't know this morning. <laughs> we, did, we did not figure it out, um, <laughs> but we did determine it was fairly long time ago. I yeah. should say that just makes me old. Mike is a, was particularly precocious and probably, <laughs> probably still in diapers as a baby. As a baby. But, um, but yeah, we could not figure it out because we've intersected in so many different places um, and yeah. through so many other sort of mutual colleagues and so forth. So Mike is joining us today from USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Um, where, as you see, he's an associate professor. People in informatics might not recognize that communication and journalism are, journalism are fields they should be paying attention to. But the short, way, the, the short answer to that is you're wrong. You should, <laughs> you should absolutely be paying attention to what's happening there because sort of like those kinds of media currents intersect in so many important ways with uh, you know, digital media of the sort that people here study. Um, and Annenberg is absolutely one of the places that you should be tracking, right? So that's where... You know, Bo and Aaron and Mimi all came to us from, from Annenberg in different kinds of capacities. So, so you should know who's up there and what they're doing. Um, and in fact, we were just sort of chatting about potential overlaps and ways to sort of uh, to build more connections. Um, and then similarly, you know, at this point in 2023 or whatever it is, sure. you know, as you probably know, everyone and their dog studies algorithms, but Mike was there first, right? So <laughs> as you go back and look at where many of our current interests and sort of thinking and conceptualizations of algorithms and their impacts and algorithms of what shapes them um, have come from, you will find Mike's name at the bottom of things. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's just trying to remember. There's a, there's a quote from Donald Muth, who's a famous computer scientist, yeah. who doesn't actually answer email. And his first thing, <laughs> thing is, email's a great job, he said, for people who want to be on top of things, but my job is to be at the bottom of things. Which is like a nice it. little way to think about it. Yeah. I'm going to make that my auto reply. <laughs> <laughs> use that as your excuse for not actually replying to your email. Oh. I, will, I, I will use that at any at a drop of a hat. So, um, so since my hat's already dropped there, um, I'm, nobody wants to hear from me. Um, <laughs> Mike, oh, you're. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, really um, thank you deeply for the invitation to be here, to meet you, especially for putting it all together, to the students I met with today and the faculty. Uh, it's a total treat to be here. And we were just saying how it's really not that far away, USC, from it. So I, I keep relearning that um, every time. So open invitation to come uh, join us there. Um, so yeah, as Paul mentioned, um, so I have been thinking about algorithms for a long time and I'm conscious that in this room and with this group, um, it's sort of the water that we're swimming in and you probably don't need, you know, sort of a big introduction or way of thinking about algorithms as, as socio-technical constructs. So I'll try to uh, compress that part. But what I mostly want to do today is think about, um, let's see, there you go. Um, Think about when algorithms make mistakes or what errors are, and specifically what errors in algorithms or in algorithmic systems, what they can teach us about things that actually have nothing to do with algorithms, like institutions, like normative value systems, like the design of media news systems. But every time an algorithm makes a mistake, hopefully by the end of this talk, I've convinced you that there's something else going on there to pay attention to. It's actually not just the algorithm to, to focus on, but there's sort of a space and a set of relations that are around it. So what I mostly want to do today, though, um, and if I manage time well, which is also always a moving target, um, is to tell you three stories, um, one of which is, well, two of which actually are from a little while ago when I was first starting this uh, work. One's a little bit more recent, um, but I want to tell you three stories of moments when algorithms made mistakes, when they broke down, and spend some time swimming in those stories and try to unpack in sort of a genealogical fashion the different sorts of dynamics and the different sort of relationships that make this as a, as a mistake. And if I've done my job, I might convince you that by the end that if we want to think deeply about algorithmic errors, one of the ways, and I say this with sort of a political theory hat on that I, that I sometimes wear, is that algorithmic errors could be public problems. And that's a really different specific formulation of what an algorithmic error could be. I don't want to try to nudge toward, this is the work that I'm sort of doing now, is how can we think about when algorithmic errors could be public problems and the knowledge work and the relational work that needs to go into making an algorithmic error a public problem. Um, my old advisor used to say a lot of times, I studied, so my, my PhD was in communication, um, I studied press freedom, and he would often always say, he's like, you know, journalism exists in tradition, not nature. 
So whenever you find yourself thinking that there's this object of study in the world that you've found or that you're going to just you know, tell the story of, no, there's a construction process. There's a making process of what that is. So that's the spirit I bring to this notion of an algorithmic error is we have to make things errors. They're not errors on their own. They have to make them errors. Okay, so um, I, I do adopt, and so Charlton Gillespie is a long time sort of collaborator, colleague, friend, and I sort of keep coming back to his definition of algorithms as quote, these things that have quote, the power to enable and assign meaningfulness, managing how information is perceived by users, what he called sort of this distribution of the sensible. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about what algorithms are. I really do not, I wanna not spend time on this at all, and I can share slides if people are curious for citations afterwards. Um, basically, they're everywhere. I think people in this room understand that, but sort of algorithmic systems as computational things, as institutional things, as normative things, social, cultural things, they're all over the place. It's just impossible to navigate your life without coming in contact or collision with some sort of algorithmic logic. They're everywhere. This is a, a definition that I want to sort of foreground for today that I've been thinking about for a while, but I, I try to think about algorithms as, quote, assemblages of institutionally situated code, practices, and norms with the power to create, sustain, and signify relationships among people and data through these minimally observable semi-autonomous actions. That's a lot of piecework there, I know. That doesn't like roll off your tongue to say that kind of definition, but I kind of do that purposely because I, I kind of come back to this as this is the material or the stuff that I work with to try to keep unpacking it. Every time I encounter an algorithmic system is to try to think about it in terms of some of these um, dynamics. But today, what I wanna focus on is this error, this breakdown problem here. So I'm, th these are the three questions that sort of motivate me or come to this body of work that I'm, I'm very much sort of, I, I have a, a couple papers out around it that I'm happy to share, but it's something that I continue to think with uh, or about. The first is I'm really just curious descriptively, what exactly are algorithmic errors? If you have sort of this notion of algorithms in mind, what the heck is an error? What does it mean for it to make a mistake? I'm also curious the sort of investments that some people seem to have in wanting errors to be particular things. And it, when you sort of want to interview people and talk to them about algorithmic errors, they usually have preferences or little theories about what they think an algorithmic error means. And then I'm curious, this last little bit of sort of how do distributions of harms drive fixes? Not all algorithmic errors are fixed. Very few actually are. So I'm curious about that remedy piece of the story here, about what kinds of errors or problems or mistakes get fixed. And to do this, I sort of, and I don't want to belabor this, but this is some of the background work that I, many people in this room are familiar with, but I sort of draw from different STS uh, literature or thinking about infrastructural inversions or failures or breakdowns. Um, Charles Perot's notion of quote, a normal accident. Um, also Diane Vaughn's work on sort of the space shuttle uh, um, Challenger explosion and sort of the organizational work that went into making that um, in some ways a, an inevitable outcome. Um, there's also a lot of recent writing on sort of glitches. Uh, my colleague Andy Lakoff writes about collapses and whether we're ready for certain kinds of collapses or not. Um, controversies, I think of Venturini and people like Norcia Maris who write a lot about how controversies are moments that we can think with. Um, and, and of course, I'm pretty heavily influenced by you know, Steve Jackson's thinking about broken world thinking. And I think I come back to that as sort of not just a, a great framework, but a, a poetic as well for how to think about things. So what I wanna do today is I also sort of influence a, sort of a, a genealogical, I think, type approach is to see algorithmic errors. We, be, if you buy my case that we have to make algorithmic errors, we, they aren't discovered, you have to make them into them, how do you make them? So the stories I wanna to tell today, the three stories are really centered on three ways of making algorithmic errors, three ways of seeing them, one through infrastructures, and I'll, I'll tell a story unpacking that, the other through sort of normativities, and I'll, I'll say more what I mean by that, and the other is a more recent example that I was, I was personally involved in um, around institutions. When do institutions think algorithmic errors matter? And in a way, what are the limits that we can see about institutions in which algorithmic errors they're willing to invest in fixing? Um, I know the story I'll tell around that one, I think is one that a lot of us in this room have shared. And then I'll end with sort of some, some speculation or some thinking about how these are public problems. Um, drawing on, I'll, I'll admit it, I'm sort of a, a Dewey in at heart, sort of thinking about the material consequentialist notions of social and cultural relations, thinking about what are, um, 
errors or problems that no matter how much money you have or privilege you have, you cannot extract yourself from the material and social conditions that cause consequences. So a lot of public life that I tend to think about is in this materialist Dewey condition of like stuff you just can't get away from. That's the pu that's public life or things you cannot get away from. Um, I can have fancier ways of saying that, but that's what I that's what I think we're sort of up to. All right, so let me dive right in. Let me do, get to this first story with that setup, thinking about algorithmic errors. Um, so if in September of 2008, ancient history at this point, but September 2008, you had gone to Google search and you had, <laughs> you had typed United Airlines into the search box of Google search, this would have been the top story that would have been returned to you through Google search. This was a story from the Sun Sentinel, the newspaper in Florida, sunsentinel.com, they're online. Um, it's also cross-posted to the Chicago Tribune. Um, there's a little story about media systems to tell here as well. But anyway, this is the story, the top story that's returned from searching on United Airlines. And it's a story of United Airlines filing for bankruptcy. It's a story of them needing protection from their creditors, uh, negotiating with workers about how to sort of triage layoffs, um, physically how to move airplanes around the world to make sure that they're not stuck in different places. But it's a story about the nuts and bolts of United Airlines and their filing for bankruptcy. Only slight problem with this is this is actually a story from 2002. This is a six-year-old story that for a brief but significant period of time was the top story for United Airlines if you're searching. It was a six-year-old story, and I'll explain just a little bit about how it happened because it matters to unpacking this as an error. If you can see at the very top left corner, it says September 7th, 2008. This is sunsentinel.com's website. Um, the date line for this story that Sun Sentinel wrote is actually, you can't see it because my screen cap was not, I wasn't smart enough to do it. At the, but anyway, at the bottom um, is the 2002 date line. Relatively simple, mundane choice that Sun Sentinel had made was to put the dates of their stories at the bottom. Google crawler is not expecting this. Google, so that's the headline of, or the uh, top left is, is that's today's paper, right? It's 2008. Google's crawler is crawling around and it just made an assumption and said, that must be the date of the story. Not a terrible assumption is, you know, works most of the time. Um, where did this story come from? Or so why would this story have significance? And I'll, I'll get to the payoff point in a minute. Um, so there's a stringer who works for Bloomberg News. The job of a stringer, especially in that era in 2008, journalism is being devastated, losing its funding. Um, people are, are, are out of work or looking for a lot of work. Stringers are often sort of having to file like six, seven stories a day on a certain beat. So this is a stringer for Bloomberg News, financial sort of mostly financial news. United Airlines is one of the companies that he's supposed to write about. So he literally wakes up, types United Airlines into the search engine to say, what can I write about today? I got, got to file something about United Airlines. What can I do that my editor is going to be happy with? And he's like, holy shit, <laughs> United Airlines filed for bankruptcy. Nobody's talking about it. This is my scoop because there's this Sun Sentinel story that I can quickly, and journalists do this all the time, sort of a derivative news work kind of thing. I can uh, file on this story does file this story. He files a story for Bloomberg News Service. Bloomberg News Service giant. is a giant news service. What happens is that story is automatically published in a lot of different kinds of places, including back to the Chicago Tribune, which is kind of like a big, you know, like, hello again moment for the <laughs> Chicago <laughs> Tribune. Um, also, there's a ton of financial trading decisions that are made automatically from parsing specifically Bloomberg News stories. So there's a a lot of financial trading that happens. <clears throat> Google eventually, so United is like, what? <laughs> you know, going on? Google gets a, you know, contacted and eventually the, the, the algorithm is fixed, but not before. This is what happens to United stock price <laughs> in this moment. Buy United. Buy United, United, right? Yeah, I know. Like, I, I don't think they necessarily did an insider trading thing, but like, what a lot of work for <laughs> insider trading to make this system work. So, okay, so here's the reason why I said I wanted to, you know, promise that there's a story of errors or story of infrastructure. One of the consistent problems that journalism studies has, sort of a, a world that I tend to come from, is to say, what the heck is the press? I, I, wrote, I re recently wrote about press freedom, but you say, well, what is the press? What is, where is journalism? In this big, messy mix, where is journalism? And what I want to say is an error actually helps us see journalism. It helps us see 
journalism as a socio-technical system through a genealogy or sort of an archaeology of this error. So let me just pick apart that a little bit. What do I mean by this error? You've got a bunch of boring stuff and maybe some interesting stuff, but that's usually the story of errors is that there's a mix of boring and interesting things. You've got date representations being in the wrong spot. You've got Google crawler making a decision about what to do and the risk it was willing to accept. You've got these organizational partnerships from Sun Sentinel, Chicago Tribune, Bloomberg News, financial trading algorithms. You've got formats that were anticipated. You've also got the poor journalistic practices, which is it's not to be made light of, it's a big deal. Think about the people that have to churn out these stories um, in a short period of time. You've also got search habits of users, right? I mean, we know that the vast majority of people are not, you know, dutifully going to page eight of those search results to see whether that's really the case. Like, that's just, we know that's not how people work. Um, you've got these automated wire services doing their thing. You've got trading habits. You've also, but you've also got some observable consequences in that stock price. Like, imagine if this system had not shown itself through the stock price drop. Or imagine if the drop had been within a range that was maybe expected or okay, maybe the error wouldn't have been discovered. As well. So you had, and I'll get a little bit later, but there was this what Andy Lakoff calls a sentinel device. We've got these little systems that are on the lookout for potential errors in the world. The stock price in a way showed us the error. Um, you've also got some human judgments going on. You've also, Google said an explicit apology, but, and it relates to the second story I'll tell, they apologized, but they did not explain. There was not a like, oh, let us, you know, open the doors and show you how the crawler made the wrong, you know, decision of what to do in that moment. They, they issued an apology. Um, and then there was apparently some backdoor stuff between Google and United because United was obviously not happy um, of how to do it. But the point I want to make here is to say, we get to know something about journalism and the press as I would argue, an infrastructural institution that has all of these socio-technical pieces, we get to see an image of the press in a careful tracing of this error. So that's the payoff in a way, like if you don't care about errors, you don't care about algorithms, but you do care about media systems as infrastructural entities, this is a way to see this. And, and there's, there's other examples sort of like this, but this is the payoff. This is what you get from seeing an error in this way. Um, well, I'll tell a different story, a slightly different story. Um, if you don't know what Grindr is, you, you, I'm not sure where you've been living, but anyway, it's a, it's a, a yeah, well, we're, sure, yeah, right. right. <laughs> so uh, I, this was when I was working at Microsoft Research, so I did my postdoc there, and as part of a workshop um, that was run by Mary Gray, um, uh, who, who's still there, um, Mary basically, so it was a it was an app called Hot Apps, and it was an app to think think about uh, ways that LGBTQ communities were convening online at the time, um, and sort of the different types of apps and social communities that were um, that were appearing. So we were handed um, don't laugh, it was a, it was a um, brand new Google phone. It was a very heady days of Microsoft research funding. Anyway, but a brand new Google phone. We were given a list of apps that we were to install like from scratch on a brand new phone. Grindr was one of the apps that we were asked to install. So I got my brand new Google phone. For people that don't know Grindr, like, yes, it's a hookup app. Yes, it's mostly, you know, well, not mostly, I shouldn't say, but it's, you know, there is a lot of um, men looking to have sex with men, but also people like Jeremy Bernholtz or uh, Jed Brubaker or a lot of other folks, um, someone at Northwestern whose name I'm forgetting, apologies. Um, have shown us that Grindr is also a lot of other things. It's not just a hookup app as well. There's a lot of identity work. There's a lot of community work that's happening. There's a lot of finding people in geographic locations that you may not be able to find in other ways. It's a really complicated um, socio-technical and cultural space. So that was one of the reasons that Mary asked us to look at it. So anyway, so I went to open up the brand new phone, went to install it, went to the Google uh, Play. It was called Google Play Store at the time. Um, the top related app for Grindr in the Google Play Store was one called Sex Offender Search. And I was like, huh. <laughs> so given what we knew even at that point about the complexity of Grindr as a lot of different things happening in Grindr, I thought that's, that's a fairly curious and pretty offensive recommendation to have as the top app that's there. Um, and you have to imagine, you know, depending on where you are and stage of life and geographic and identity work that you're at, that could be a fairly jarring and harmful thing to see 
that is the app that is most related that the Google algorithm and, you know, a quote, objective, neutral arbiter of relational entities um, that it said that. So I got, this was, you know, partly at the time I, oh, sorry, let me just say for a second, sorry, I should have said this. What is sex offender search? So sex offender search is an app uh, at the time it was this app that quote, this is their description of themselves. Sex offender search keeps your family protected by letting you know where sex offenders are in your neighborhood. This app uses the most up-to-date information from the National Sex Offender Registry, which is a side story to say that's that's also, it's a very problematic registry in a lot of different kinds of ways um, for reasons I can get into in the Q&A if you want to, but it's not, um, uh, yeah, that's a, it's complicated. I'll just say it's complicated for now, but anyway. But the aim of this app, what this app promises is they'll literally let you navigate the world or your neighborhood with your little blue dot because it'll place the homes of sex offender registered sex offenders that are in this registry so that you can take a path that avoids the places that those people have registered that is what the app promises it's couched in a lot of claims about safety and family and all that kind of stuff anyway but so remember this is the top related app that's coming for for grinder uh, at the time so i got a little this is like my 15 minutes of fame moment really i got a little i was like that doesn't seem right i was so i wrote this article, this is again a while ago now, but um, wrote this article for The Atlantic and basically thinking about the ramifications and the consequences and the, the implications of this kind of algorithmic recommendation where this is, you know, what would it, what would it mean in the world if you were to see this? Um, anyway, so the, the, the article is still up, you could do it, but I wrote this article, thought it was kind of the end of the story. <clears throat> I was contacted by Google, communications, basically their PR. So I got this email. Uh, I was also, at, I was a postdoc at Harvard at the time. So I guess, I, I guess Harvard had like the right fanciness or something. So he wrote to Harvard instead. <laughs> um, so he says, hey, Mike, my name is blank and I do communications for Android. I saw your article in the Atlantic about Android market. Um, and I wanted to reach out to hopefully provide some info on related apps feature, how it works, et cetera. Let me know if you have some time for a quick, quick chat, thanks. So I got that email. I was like, interesting. Okay. Just falling into some field work here. Okay, let's do this. So I made it, I, this was a Friday, I believe. And I made it a time, a time to uh, speak with him on a Monday, partly because I was like, I don't want to talk to you right away. Just my spidey sense said, I want to just let this play out a little bit. I don't want to, I just want to see what's going to happen. So I was reloading this page a lot because I was kind of curious, like what was happening? So I wrote a little script to sort of reload this page a lot and notice any differences that were in the page. Um, after that, so in the timeline, you can see, I really, I can't make speculations about what exactly was happening, but these are these are two apps that I would argue are probably more in the same space of Grindr. So one called Scruff, one called Adam for Adam, but these are sort of, I would, I would suggest more reasonable or expected, I guess, uh, related apps for Grindr. So I was like, that's interesting. So I, I was keeping logs of all these you know, changes and noticing the differences every time they happened. Um, the article got picked up a little bit um, in some other press. Um, I started getting some emails and some messages that I don't recommend getting. It was a, it was a little, the inbox was not a fun place to be for a little while, but I also just kept saving these messages and I was finding myself trying to make sense of this moment again in 2011 of what these algorithms were doing. And so keep that in mind for the part of the story I'll tell later in a little bit. So then no apps or no, apps. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. So gone. That's curious. Okay, so I'm just like building up this little corpus. Then I talked to uh, the Google representative, and I was keeping notes. <laughs> I was like treating this as a sort of an interview-based uh, thing. I did not agree to say off the record. He asked me to, and I said I wouldn't. Um, and it was sort of this like you know fun little. I'm like we can have this conversation if you want to or not, but I'm not going off the record. Like that's that's my my own ethos here. Anyway. So, but we had this conversation that was in some ways a little boring, but also a little bit interesting, going back to that theme of algorithmic errors. So he tells me, so I have a, I, I am not a good computer scientist by any stretch of the imagination. I did my undergraduate partly in computer science and human biology. I've struggled with code. I've written bad code. I've written bad code that behaved in bad ways. I've sort of like, I have a sense of how data structures and algorithms and different sort of types of, of code work. So he was explaining to me how this works. And I found it curious. 
he was like, oh, well, let me tell you. He said, well, app features, they're extracted from the apps, they're weighted, they're aggregated through an algorithm. It's like, sort of like, no shit. Yes, exactly. Like, that's not interesting as a thing. Like, you're not telling me something like new, I guess, in a way. You're not really giving me much of a thing. And he said, well, here's what happened. What you saw there, that was unfortunate. But there was, quote, a bug in the weightings. A bug in the weightings. Yeah. And he says, but he says, it's important for you to know the weightings were changed. So that's that's what was going on there. That's why you were seeing the sort of, you know, different things appearing or disappearing. The weightings are changed. But I want to stress with you, the, en the engineer did not change the algorithm. I was like, well, I don't know where the algorithm is then. I don't know what, what do you mean by algorithm as this thing? Um, and then he said, so I, I also said to him, like, the engineer, again, I'm like, I don't, I don't know how Google works, but I'm, yeah, I'm like, I'm pretty sure there's not a, a dude in a room who like, and you just tapped him on the shoulder and said, change the algorithm. Like, I don't think that's how that works. And he said, well, okay, you're right. So actually there is no, we actually, he's not exactly sure how the change happened, but then we made several changes to the system. No one exactly understands how, uh, how it works. And also at the time he said, we don't have the ability to go back and like replay exactly how that was produced, also produced for me or produced in that space or that time on a brand new phone. He said, that's too much, we just don't have the ability to replay that. But he said, no, we don't, you know, nobody understands it. So for me at this point, I'd sort of fallen into, in a way, this um, question of like, well, I don't know where the algorithm is then. I don't know where it is. And I definitely don't know where the error is. But here's what was happening. I was getting more comments on the news stories. I was getting a whole bunch of emails sent to me. I had this one conversation with the Google rep. Um, I had some of this. In a way, I had, and I, I'm not saying this is like a methodologically airtight thing that I was doing here. So I don't, this is very much a convenience case study that I dropped into. Um, but I had all this stuff and I was sort of wanting to make some meaning with this and see what could happen. So I was curious of this little corpus of empirical materials, you know, where do people think the algorithm is? What do they think the mistake that was made? Why do they think there was a mistake? What evidence is it? And what ended up happening was I ended up uh, uh, getting these, these um, uh, sort of qualitative uh, comments that were appearing in a lot of different forums and, and emails and things. So I'll just give you a little bit of a taste of some of the themes that were coming through on some of the emails that I got and some of the, the, the comments that were left. So the first one, says, quote, I don't see why anyone should be the least surprised this association was made. It's simple. Both apps relate to sexual deviance and perverts. I've never heard of this app before. Get somebody in your life and things like this become non-issues. If two apps are related, isn't that based on people's actions and therefore indicative that people who view or install one also view or install the other? These are folk theories. I would guess that both apps are tagged as being primarily focused on geographic searches for sexually related information. One, normal, healthy, and social grinder. The other, aberrant, sick, and criminal sexual predation. Also not showing like, the uh, literacy with the National Sex Offender Registry was not part of this either. Um, personally, I'd see, ah, two geolocative apps grouped together. I honestly would not presume any moral link. Computers don't see morality, so how could they make such an association? It's a whole bunch of little folk theories. There's a whole bunch of, these are messy comments in a way. And these are sort of, I extracted ones that sort of are um, pointing to broader themes that were there. But what I ended up sort of seeing, and again, this is sort of a little early stages, but people had these folk theories of what algorithms were. And they also had little theories about when they thought they had failed or when they had thought they had broken down. So as much as, you know, I promise you in the first story was like, a view of algorithmic errors can teach you something about how these infrastructures in the media system was working. What I think was sort of happening here is that a view of algorithmic errors and people's folk theories and diagnoses of what those errors were and how the algorithm can teach you something about some of the normativities that are going into this particular domain. Um, so let me get a little more specific on what I mean by that. Um, so I tried to think about these materials and, and, and some of the, the follow-on materials that were there. It's like, where is the algorithm? Where do people think the algorithmic, uh, or sorry, the associational algorithm exists in? Where is the association happening? And what's what needs to be done to quote fix the algorithm? This is the story moving a little bit into the remedy bit a little bit. So some people, I would say, some of the themes were that this was about mirroring reality, and that the algorithmic associations were true. Think about that guy who was like, yeah, these are both related to uh, uh, sexual predation and perversion. That's these are social and cultural values. 
it is quote unquote correct. For some of those people, there is no mistake. There's, there's no error. There's nothing to fix. So if you wanted to quote fix or make an intervention into that, how or where would you do that? You'd probably need to sort of engage in critique beliefs and values and normative systems and ethical um, systems that are there. Another body of sort of folk theory though, is that it reflects what people do. There was sort of this, what they click on, what they download, and that this is about an aggregation of practices and the association lives in how those practices are traced, um, how they're aggregated, sort of the calculative aspect of how those, um, uh, those actions are added up. So if you want to quote, fix the algorithm, and I would say this is probably sort of a Google-ish type approach, right, of what they're doing. To fix that algorithm, they were just going to sort of tweak the, the summation or the weighting or the, because you're, they're like, yeah, that didn't give us the result that we are really happy with. So we'll just tweak the weighting, but you want to figure out how the algorithm works technically and fix it. And that's where that was working. There was also sort of a set of, and this is some interviews that I did as well. It's the algorithm is this sort of like kind of unfortunate, weird product of something that's as big as the internet. And there was a lot of like hand wavy at this point. People are like, I don't really know. I'm not sure. Like, where does the data come from? So the algorithm association is sort of nowhere in particular. It's no one place. It's in partly the code. It's in people's actions, their perceptions. And this is, you know, where I tend to probably spend most of my life is in sort of this bottom right corner is what you want to do then is you want to sort of try to critique these sort of uneven, hard to trace associations that are living across different sort of material practices, different um, coding cultures, different sort of data extraction ideals and different uh, normative stances. And that's, that's where you're gonna do the fixing. It's not gonna be in any one place or another, but you gotta speak both of those languages to go across. Um, so that's what I was sort of trying to, to think about through that is that you can probably see normativities and also relationships to how people think socio-technical systems are constructed, how they think the people and the materials are relating to each other. You can see that in their reactions to the errors or you even think there was an error um, at all. So I want to shift to a third story I want to tell you about algorithmic error. Um, and this is probably a little you know, closer to home in a lot of ways, more, far more recent for sure, um, but I think sort of rounds out a story, um, which is the story of how institutions think about themselves in relation to algorithmic errors. Um, I, I actually, I, I didn't, I should have looked ahead of time, but I'm not sure exactly how uh, UC Irvine responded to it, but at USC when March, 2020 hit and we sort of, you know, transitioning quickly from in-space uh, learning environments to online ones, um, there was this thing that happened where, especially at that period of time in our semester, people were trying to figure out what do we do about final exams, right? So March, 2020, what do we do with final exams? Um, what does student evaluation look like? What should it look like? And we've got this sort of host of, of different software companies. There's a whole bunch. They kind of, a lot of them do really similar things in a lot of ways, um, some of the, the names there. Um, but there was, a, there was a, a need for the university, I would argue, to do a bunch of different things at once. And you kind of have to remember, like there was a lot of, and I was on some of these, task force or working groups trying to like respond rapidly. So there was a need to do standardized evaluations. Some people wanted to do that and I'll unpack that a little bit, but they were sort of like, how do we do this? And they're like, well, we'll use the students own computers as these sort of surveillance devices, right? That can, so this is, I think probably most of you know how this works, but it's, you know, you're sitting there, you're taking the exam. Um, there's a camera, your camera in your laptop or an external camera. It's looking at you, it's paying attention to where your head is. There's probably also, depending on the software, the configuration, it's using the microphone to figure out, um, is there background noise? It's dude, locking down your browser or your, so it's not letting you go to other um, settings. It's paying attention to your keystroke rate and it's making, and these are all signals. These are all signals that it's doing to try to detect a potential uh, academic violation or a plagiarism or uh, cheating basically, right? It's trying to say, we're going to use all these signals to try to detect a cheating event, cheating event. Um, so this is the task that sort of people who were invested in standardized evaluations, they're like, great, students have these little devices that can do all of this. We'll just do online testing that way. That's, that's where we'll go. Um, there was a strong, you know, a desire to align with the existing practices, especially you got to think about 
very large classes. Um, think about your sort of intro calculus, intro chemistry, large classes where they're like, there is a right answer to, you know, what's, you know, like, what's the integral, what's the derivative, like there's, there's an answer to what's this chemical compound, there's an answer. It's not necessarily maybe um, the way a lot of humanistic or social science folks works, but there's a large answer, uh, a right answer. And they've been doing these tests for years, a lot of times. The people teaching these classes, so there's also this sense of professorial autonomy, this idea that there, at least I think in many universities, there's a hesitation to get too in the weeds on how professors do evaluation, although it sort of happens in subtle ways. But there's a tendency to say, well, that's part of academic freedom is your ability to design your pedagogical environments within reason on um, what you want to do. There's also these sort of, you know, we had an uneven experience at our university in terms of the English professors were like, I don't care. I don't do that. That's not what I do. The calculus math people were like, I do do that. And there was also this, I this brand protection theme that was happening here because, you know, USC couldn't be a place that handed out degrees to students who cheated. So there had to be some kind of institutional response to say, we've got our basis covered. We're not just throwing open the doors um, to academic plagiarism. So here's, you know, what ended up happening, and again, maybe you're probably familiar with this, but what ended up happening here is that a um, whole bunch of sort of claims of academic integrity violations, uh, cheating claims that had been made. Um, but what we also saw was a really particular example where students of color were being treated very and systematically different from other students, specifically in relation to facial detection, which was tracking, think about the camera, tracking the head to make sure that you're not, if you're taking an exam, you're not looking down because you might have notes, you're not looking up because who knows what's on the ceiling, you're not looking this way because somebody off camera might be telling you the answer. Um, so there was a desire to track a face. Many people in this room, you guess ahead of me, right? But like a lot of the machine learning systems are, trace, are trained on data sets that mostly white faces that are not accounting for um, the diversity of the student body population, but are producing answers that are statistically sort of good enough for a model to sort of say something about a facial detection system. Um, but we saw, and this was, so what happened was we saw a bunch of sort of popular press stories saying that students of color may be being treated differently by facial detection systems because they were basically having all of these false positives of saying that, you know, all of these students of color are doing academic violations. And that is a, um, and so there was all these popular press reports that are saying, wait, that can't be, that doesn't check out, that doesn't check out a thing. So I was part of a provost task force that was charged with basically answering this question of did our electronic proctoring systems, facial detection systems treat students of color differently than white students? And I was part of the provost asked me to sit on this task force, um, sort of answer this question. So um, to be clear, uh, we talked to our vendor. Um, our vendor said, yeah, our facial detection software does have a higher rate of error for students of color. We had to ask the question, by the way, just one of the first point, we had to ask the question. It was not volunteered, we had to ask the question. We did not have any evidence that those differences had played out in cases of, uh, that were brought up to our uh, academic um, violations board. We did not have uh, cases of professors reporting it. We did not have cases where students had reported it. And by and large, it was sort of a phenomenon that the vendor said, yes, technically this does exist as a difference that we see in the populations, but we did not see that in our population at that moment. And there were different reasons for why they thought that was, that some people were using different systems, but we, we still had, our official systems were treating students of color differently. So the provost says, what do we, what's our recommendation of what to do? And what I want to report on out here a little bit is, um, uh, I also say this, this is also like, I have tenure, it's fine. Um, so what, do we, what happened? So I want to give you a sense of sort of the flavor of conversations or sort of the space of, of responses. And this is not, I'm not sharing proprietary or private information. This was sort of our, our deliberations um, uh, without attaching any names or quotes or anything like that. I want to give you a sense of the themes that we were considering as we were considering what to do. And the reason I want to say this is that this is an algorithmic, first of all, we can, you know, should we use that error? Where, where is this error? Where is this failure in this system? 
exactly. Not just that it is treating suits of color differently, but if we had to get forensic and treat where is this error exactly, that was sort of the spirit I went into this conversation with, again, with sort of my STS hat on is like, I want to, try, I want to show a space of error that could be with here. These are the different ways I think, some of the ways that we considered the error. I'm going to go through them just a little bit um, one by one, not, not linger too long a little bit. But so the first was, and the, honestly, the by and large, the first was like, this was a technical error. So this was a technical, the vendor said they would fix it. As if you've ever dealt with vendors, they also said, we're not sure when we'll fix it. And they also did not give us the ability to audit the fix to say, did you really fix it? Or so the vendor said, we'll fix it on our time, Brian, on our timeline, uh, but we won't provide verification. This was a kicker. This was one of, so this is the vendor's recommendation to be clear, not our, not our institutional. We threw this out super fast, but the vendor's recommendation said, actually just get your students of color to front light themselves because they will then appear more legible to the facial detection The system. university has ring lights. So. <laughs> I'm sure we would not fund them, but yes, I'm sure. Anyway, um, so this was the thing. Um, if people know, if you don't know Simone Brown's work, get to know Simone, Simone Brown's work, Dark Matters. Um, what I, my product was raised in the provost meeting and I was trying to, you know, with historian of technology hat on, not a big hat, but a little historian of technology hat on, I was like, do you guys know about lamplighting laws in New York? And like, so these laws that were put into place, so specifically the infrastructure of surveillance for people of color in New York at that time, there were no lantern standards that were there. So by law, people of color had to carry with them lanterns to illuminate themselves to law enforcement in New York. Simone Brown writes her up as beautifully, also in relation to um, design of slave ships and design of carceral systems. And just, there's, it's, I cannot recommend her work highly enough. Beautiful work. So anyway, I was like, this sounds like lamplighting a lot. I gotta say, like this sounds like, so we are asking students to invest in their own technology of illumination to make themselves visible to our surveillance systems. No, that's not, that's not what we're ever doing. But this is the vendor's recommendation, right? We're supposed to do this. Um, other sort of spaces of responses to the error is pedagogical. So trying to get faculty to just don't use these kinds of evaluations at the systems at all. Um, also, there was a question of have professors had too much autonomy in their design of evaluation? Should we actually, as a university, discontinue these types of evaluation mechanisms altogether? If you're the provost in the middle of a pandemic, that's a pretty you know, big organizational thing is to dictate to faculty how they should be evaluating students. He was understandably like not super great about that. Um, we also had some equity issues because we had this, this question that he sort of raised us, well, honest students are, quote, honest students are suffering if cheaters succeeded. But we also knew that we had good sort of anecdotal evidence at that time, but there's large socioeconomic status differences, right? So if you're a student who is able to be in a stable environment with no sound in the background, that is a well-lit environment, that you can get your roommates or your family out of your room so that you can focus on doing this test. Like we, we were asking them to recreate an environment that we were previously doing for them in a room like this. Like we were previously taking on the work of creating that kind of quiet you know, environment for them to do that. Um, question though also was like, so this was not a problem for you know, small poetry classes or things. This was, this was an economics issue, right? The university needs to run classes of this size. It needs standardized tests. It needs to be able to have sort of a, a low marginal cost to add a student to a 200 person class because you get one faculty, some TAs, but you can get a pretty nice tuition revenue increase for each student that you add into those large classes. So the university was like, not gonna say, we're not gonna do large classes anymore. That wasn't part of the fix. We also had this problem of, as faculty were receiving these notifications, um, again, imagine, so you put yourself in, if you're a faculty or if you're a student, you're getting this answer of saying, well, you may have been suspected of cheating. If you're faculty, then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of students of color are showing up as potential cheaters. Were our faculty sufficiently self-aware and equipped to understand that pattern that was being presented to them as neutral, objective, technological, right? All those things that are sort of supposedly devoid of values. I would say we weren't sure that our faculty were ready or able to handle the, you know, their own sense of this bias. And then lastly, the sort of brand issue of like, um, 
we needed to be issuing degrees that were not part of this kind of uh, potential GP kind of system. Okay, um, so this is the space. What did we do? Provost, so we discontinued, this is the official provost message that provost sent, discontinued the use of Respondus Monitor, um, an online exam, by the, the number of hours that went into this language, by the way, was kind of fun, so I won't, I won't share with you how the sausage is made, but um, that uses artificial intelligence because there were, quote, a number of concerns about fairness and privacy, no mention of race in this at all. And we actually, the, the task force was a little, um, Divided about uh, like about whether to decide for reasons I can get into in the Q and A, but um, said we may. So their work, the respondus is working on modifying and enhancing their software. Still waiting. Um, we may consider reuse at a later date, um, and they're going to sort of support faculty who might want to use other kinds of options um, for doing things. But this was what was fascinating for me about this was that actually the provost was comfortable making this decision because he said the software is not reliable. Think about that word reliability for a second. That was to me the, the fascinating takeaway. He said it's not producing reliably the co correct result. So therefore, that's the error. The error is in the lack of reliability. Um, I, I jokingly sent him Donald McKenzie's book on inventing accuracy, which we didn't talk much after that. But I was like, I was like, accuracy and reliability is really interesting. And he's like, yeah, we're not going to. Talk okay, about FTS. that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yes, yes, guys, stop saying that. But anyway, so the point is he bounded the error in the reliability of the facial detection system. We really didn't get to a lot of other of these things, but that was, that was an, I would argue that's an institutional decision for how to sort of do crisis management, how to bound the error, how to do these things. Okay, um, and then the coda was that uh, it was actually ruled unconstitutional to scan students' rooms um, later. So the, the, basis of the software was actually ruled uh, unconstitutional in August of 2020. Okay, so bring it in for landing. Um, thinking across these three examples, um, I want to argue that algorithmic errors can be a bunch of different things at once. And in a sense, there's, I'm not going to collapse it into one single thing, but what could they be? They can be evidence of folk theories. They can be evidence of what people think algorithms are. They can be what Lakoff calls these sentinel apparatuses, right? Think about that United stock price drop. They can be little markers of things that might be about to go wrong at any minute. They can be these things that trigger responses. And, they, and we need, in a way, you want errors that trigger responses because invisible errors are even harder to deal with. Um, they're normative in a sense. Think about the grinder folks. They're, you think about what counts as the error. We actually got to see people saying things like, there was no error there at all. Um, I also think you get these sort of thresholds of consequences and, and you know, think about Dewey a little bit here, but I think that some errors were things that got fixed and others were not. Think about our, our USC experience. We still have, there's a lot broken that still exists if that was the framing of it. Um, we have these institutional niches. I, I draw upon Powell and DiMaggio's notion of neo-institutional sociology of thinking about institutions as what they call, quote, loosely coupled arrays of standardized elements is this lovely quote of like, that's what an institution is. Um, algorithmic errors and algorithmic systems are part of how institutions couple themselves together, how they bind themselves. And we've also got this sort of power to define. We've got this idea that some folk theories of the algorithms are gonna dominate than others. Some sentinels are gonna be more or less sensitive. Some moral orders are gonna be more or less um, powerful, but that's what the algorithmic errors leave us, is they leave us this ability to see how power is circulating in relation to these systems. Okay, and I'll end with just last couple slides, just to say these are pull, algorithmic errors are everywhere. If you, if you look for them, they're everywhere. They're everywhere, you know, Google share price drop, it's AI made a bad mistake. Um, uh, Apple's watch, right? Thinking all these people uh, riding roller coasters had died. Did you read about this? So no. these making and automatically making 911 calls based on the uh, accelerometer decisions that were made on the phone. So people on roller coasters with their Apple watches and uh, ambulances being sent to um, amusement parks. And they're like, we have reports of like 30 people just died on your like, no, That's not what happened. Um, but kind of the 911 operators were a little bit like, um, not cool. We just sent all these like, how do we know where to invest public resources in this or not? Because you are automatically uh, allowing an error to drive an allocation of resources. Okay, so bring it all back. This is what I say, Dewey. So where Dewey sees public problems as consequences 
someone like Norcha Maris sees them in material cultures. Um, I want a big plug in for um, Joseph Gusfield, a book that doesn't, I think, get enough attention anymore. But he talked about the invention of drink of drunk driving as a public problem that became not just something for families to deal with and not just something for a bartender to do or not do, but how do you get public problems? Where do you get problems that are inextricable consequences that you cannot extract yourselves from? And he said it's this combination of scale and pattern and harm, and that's how you make public problems. This is my last slide. So this is what I hopefully have done a little bit. Sorry for a little over time. Um, but these are, I want to say, if you can get algorithmic errors to be not idiosyncratic quirks of private institutions that they will fix or not fix on their own timelines, and if, if you can tell a story of an algorithmic error or make an algorithmic error into something that is about shared consequences and material cultures and knowledge work around scale and patterns and harms, this is the language of public problems. This is what political theorists would say. That's what makes it something for us to collectively see ourselves intertwined with, because that's what makes um, this, this kind of social collective life that you cannot extract yourself from. So I will stop there and say thank you very much. Appreciate it. OK, you guys, your job is not just prevent me from asking my question. <laughs> and I'm sorry I went over time. I hope no. I'm happy to. We're fine. We're pretty chill. And we okay. can we'll go out okay. and have chat afterwards, too. Ah, okay. So. OK, cool. Hi, yes. Hi. Um, I'm curious, for the primary piece that you were talking about, before your Atlantic story was published, how many times did you see that consistently that um, sexual predator app was coming? Because you reported on Africa, but before, how many times did it keep on consistently coming? Yeah. Um, so I did. So I wrote when I when I saw the association happening. Um, that's when I wrote the script to start paying attention to whether or not right. um, the change had happened. And then and then I wrote the article, and the article came out. And then so it was consistent from when I first started track uh, just paying attention to that recommendation be there. So that was a stable appearance of that. And then the only switches were the ones that I that I documented in the timeline on when that I, I don't remember off the top of my head when the timeline, but it was after. So it was stable until that point. Like days or even yeah, days. it was like two or three days it was stable. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, please. Everyone should solve me talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first slide of the um, current student during the uh, Sorry, the, the, which slide? Uh, this one? This. Yeah. Okay. Well, just, I'm curious, uh, the slide, I couldn't catch it while listening. Oh, okay, sure, yeah, okay. And I usually, I'm happy to share the slide deck if there's a way to share it afterwards. There is interesting that you had a side point on this slide, which I think is not a side point at all, which okay. is they didn't offer this information. Yeah. So what I think one element of this error is the recognition that there even is one. If you had some, who, where are these stories coming from such that USC and hopefully other organizations, but now I'm very curious about UCI, um, even had enough to then investigate. Mm -hmm. So because this could have happened, this could have gone on forever. So what's going on here that they, that, that that it was surfaced to enough that people could then Yeah. I mean so with my journalism studies hat on, this is journalism. Yeah. I mean this is yeah, this is exactly this is so journalists like, who are um you know and this is journalists get beaten up about doing this in a way, but like taking the one off anecdote and then blowing and it then up. blowing it up and I think and I think in this case, this is so a lot of these, and I, I can share the actual, stories. these are actual news articles. These are headlines. Yeah, yeah these are actual that, stories. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and it was sort of the journalists who were covering this were sort of like, I don't know, that seems weird. And then you sort of talk to more people and you're like, oh, that happened with you too. And you talk to more. And so the good journalistic work is sort of stitching together this into this pattern. And then enough of these stories go and it starts to, you know, become visible. Um, but I guess I, I only, like I wrote our CIO and I was like, are you seeing this? And then that's what you know brought us in that task force. Yeah. Well, and relatedly, yeah. I mean, the way you presented it suggested that you don't even talk to respondents, they come straight back and say, yes, 
if there is this issue, right? But, but it's like, how much work does it take for them to figure it out? Or did they already know the answer to that question? It's I like, oh yeah, we're, we're yeah. conscious of this. Yeah. Because the other part that always surprises me about these things is, you know, there's an ethical issue surrounding sort of bias in data sets for sure. There's a whole other problem, which is people surprised there's bias in data. Yeah. Like, or <laughs> technologists surprised. It's like, what? We yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how yeah. can we possibly be? That's yeah. a different kind of problem, not an ethical problem. Yeah, yeah, and sharing the data sets as well, because also like this, like Examsa, Proctorio, Proctorio response, really curious names, but um, they a lot of them are sharing training data, right? They're sharing, some of them are sharing models, some of them are trying, making their own models, but from public training data sets. And there's, so there's actually, there's also like a consolidation of this institutional space of machine learning, because it's like, how many different ways can there be to like detect a face from a camera? A lot of them are like, yeah, there's publicly available data sets. So they're just providing a wrapper on top of the model that they're using to make it. So, and that was kind of a, I don't think people realize like how homogenous that space actually technologically is. It's really quite consistent. Yeah. Oh, thanks. This is a great talk and, and really, um, Generative. I wanted to pop back early in your, you invoked Diane Vaughn, collapse, other sort of big accent yeah. kind of stories. Yeah. And I'm, I think what strikes me is in each of your stories, just how resilient these systems, institutions, and infrastructures are to these errors. Yeah. And we often think of resilience as sort of a benefit in these systems. And I'm wondering, but it, it feels like the fixes here are not real fixes. And I'm wondering if you can, I don't know, maybe just speak to that a little bit. No, that's such a great question and observation. And honestly, uh, I mean, in my, <laughs> try to stay you know, optimistic about this kind of work, but you sort of think, yeah, what, what is this work or being on that task force or like, what are we, what are we doing in all of this? Like, what do we? Because you're right, the fix stayed narrow, and I think I'm curious to like, and I haven't, I haven't done this, and I'm not sure who has done it, but um, sort of almost connect like there's a, you know, we teach it in our school, but there's like a crisis comms, crisis communications, professionalism, which is all about containing, minimizing you know, bracketing and sort of reducing risk and reducing fallout and reducing. And what I'm curious, I don't know how the crisis communication industry understands socio-technical failure, but I would be kind of curious to know whether those that professional community is getting good at, like when faced with this facial detection issue, they're like, great, we're gonna bound it, keep it, like we do this and we do, and that's, but do not ask us to, challenge the economic business model of the university or like don't ask professors to rethink their evaluation mechanisms so yeah because a lot of these people at our university too like there's like a boatload of consultants that are helping them deal with a crisis and I'd be curious to know how that professional community understands the socio there was a comment in the person from google that nobody understands it so nobody's responsible yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I gotta, I mean, to have some, it's, it's, I mean, I just, I come back to layers of an onion as my metaphor for this, because the comms guy from Google, I, this is a side story, we, we did keep in touch, and later he actually uh, asked me, he was like, I'm thinking of going back to grad school, do you have programs you'd recommend? Because <laughs> And I was like, oh, what a wonderful coda to the whole thing, but um, so did, can so, you go yeah. back to grad school? I don't know. We kind of lost touch after that, but I did. We had this conversation. I'm like, well, there's this thing called, you know, socio-technical studies of systems. And I'm like, seems like you'd be a great fit if you're like, if you're interested in this, in this thing. Um, so I think to my most generous feeling is like a lot of the humans working in those organizations get it. Like they're not, they're not ignorant to the scope or scale of these issues, but it also becomes sort of a, um, and I have a set of students working on this question right now, but sort of like, what is, what model of change needs or could be thought about in these socio-technical systems. And I also think about the timelines of change because there's like an immediate response, there's a medium term response. like what is the long-term, how do we fix, the, like, anyway, I think you get the idea. But yeah, I just think about, I don't know what the model of change is that 
response to it. We should take maybe one more. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I got long winded. I'm happy to stick around. Just a couple, I think. Right. I, you run it. I'm not going to pick. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. In thinking about a lot of these algorithms, there's been a lot of talk around like the Spangle AI or AI transparency. And where do you think that sort of fits in this conversation or the scope of like error, whether it's error prevention, um, prevention or error awareness? Yeah. No, it's a really that's a great question. Um, I think my my big attitude is sort of like there's like an all hands on deck kind of approach. So I was like, yes, sure. Explainable AI, I, the hesitation I sometimes have is sort of that type of intervention or that type of mechanism is only going to go so far and also is, is internally sometimes not terribly able to even explain the phenomenon that it might be concerned with. So an attempt to explain how a system works, sure, that's great. And I, and with an understanding that you're probably not going to arrive at, because a lot of the systems are so dynamic and uh, sort of probabilistic, you're always going to arrive at an explanation that might work in this context, in this moment, in these set of circumstances. And that has value. And I don't, I would not denigrate that value at all. My only concern sometimes about explainable AI is that it, it doesn't what I would want it to do is like take one step further out and think about the institutional conditions or think about the cultural conditions because if the if an if an answer of like how the facial detection system was working was presented in this like the nicest cleanest possible explainable AI, I'm not sure that would have moved the needle on any of those other issues. And I worry in a way that like we we may get too good at that, which would bound the the scope of the change that could be possible if the error was leveraged into something that was more of a, a broader um, call to action that the answer is to say. I don't know if that makes sense. Can you elaborate more on that a little? Like, so what would be a broad? Well, so like if, if we had explainable AI, so suppose packaged with our vendor, Respondus, like suppose Respondus is like, and part of our software suite is this account of exactly how the how the system works and the thing. By the way, um, you know, we have an error rate, we have a false positive rate for, yeah, I'm gonna, this is gonna, this is the language that they were using, but it's sort of like unexpected or non-standard, or like they would say things like that. And you say, well, that's the error rate that we just can't do anything about. So we're just, but we're gonna tell you about the error rate. We're gonna do it. I I don't know what's done, like you need a follow-up question. You need a bunch of follow-up questions to say, what are either the social or cultural or um, what are the normative dimensions of these error rates? And I can have that explain, I can have that part of an explainable AI framework, um, but I do need a normative stance on whether, like, how are those errors distributed? Who's suffering the harms of those errors? What kinds of ramifications come from those harms? If that's not part of the explainable framework, and I, and I, I should say, I don't, I'm not, I don't know enough probably about the variations of that approach. Um, that would be my concern, is that it's presented as the end of a conversation rather than, you know, a, a real hard consideration of whether it should happen at all. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it's nice to imagine an explainable AI system that, that actually that says, yeah, man, that's just messed up. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. Which should kind of be the end result of like, you definitely should not do that. I gotta, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I talked to various people along the way about this, and there was mostly like a jaw drop of like, why are they not discontinuing this like yesterday? Like, why is this not like why? Why is this even a task force to debate? Like, what this is this shouldn't be. Um, so the fact that there was it got caught into process is not the best thing. Like, it should have been. Why did we need a task force on that? Anyway. Well, an explainable or ex expected error. There's a lot packed in there. Totally. What is expected? What is norm? What yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, Facebook does this on their on their content moderation stuff. They're like, oh, we catch like ninety seven percent of offensive. Uh, harmful speech. Uh, tell me about the three. I don't know, like what's yeah. going on with the three. I yeah. want to know that. Right. So. Okay, we should. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, sorry. We should. We should just take it outside. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Reasonably conversation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.